Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this online session for Lichen Improvers with April Windle. Um, I think most of you know me, but my name is Lindsay Marne. I'm the Citizen Science Assistant from the Saving Devon's Treescapes project, and lichens are part of our species monitoring within the project. Just a reminder that Saving Devon's Treescapes is a partnership project which is run by Devon Wildlife Trust on behalf of the Devon Ash Dieback Resilience Forum and in partnership with very many partners across the county and nationally. And we're sponsored or funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund, One Tree Planted and other funders as well. So we're very grateful to have April with us tonight for this session. Uh, it's the second that she's run for us. The first was just before Christmas in December. And what we're planning to do this evening is show and tell. So we're gonna have a look at lichen photos that you brought along with you work through the identifications as far as you can and as a group we can all benefit from that and take the identification the rest of the way and then later on in the session we'll also run through how to do some simple chemical testing and I'll talk to you a bit about how to record your lichens with the Saving Devon's Treescapes um, website. So April welcome and over to you would you like to say anything by way of introduction tonight? Yeah, so hi everybody. I think I met some of you at the last session, so it's great to see some familiar faces and also people that I've met at the at actual lichen events in face to face as well. So yeah, thanks for coming along. It's a really wonderful turnout and I think that's very reflective on all the wonderful work that's happening with lichens down in Devon at the moment. And Although I'm from Devon originally, and I'm very patriotic about my home county, um, I'm currently living in the north, but I still wanted to try and support in whatever way I can, hence these little Zoom chats that we've got um, on the go. So I'm April, April Windle, and I guess, I, I like to call myself a naturalist, but I guess I am a lichenologist, um, a lichen enthusiast, and my whole life has revolved around lichens in various capacities. I seem to eat, sleep and breathe them at the minute. Um, but today's session, you know, like last time, there's no real formal structure at all. I like to keep these as informal as possible. And I think how it's been um, sort of advertise this session is that you guys come along with uh, any queries or any questions or any photographs that you'd like to share and then we can work through them as a group collectively and try and support one another. So I hope that sounds okay. I think the best way to ask these questions is either to raise your hand um, either physically um, or you there's like a little yellow hand icon somewhere at the bottom of the screen. Um, or if not, put your question in the chat box and somehow, hopefully, we'll get around all of the questions. I'm not sure how many people have got questions and how many people are just wanting to listen, but um, I will try my utmost to get through all of the questions. And I'm very lucky I've got support from like Fred and Lindsay, so we should be able to get through through quite a couple. Okay, does that sound all right to everybody? Fabulous, okay, excellent. So um, yeah, please do fire questions, raise hands. Um, Shall we start with a little show of hands of, of um, everybody that's got something they want to show tonight? So Martin, Mary, Sonia. Charles, Biddy. Charles, Biddy. And I've got a, qu a question from Mary and as Sonia. well. Okay. Yeah. April, any particular order? Oh, and Toby. Have, have you put them down, yeah. Lindsay? Yes, yeah. Yeah, can, you, look, can we go in the name of your, in, in the uh, order of your list? On my <laughs> list, okay, Martin, you're up first. If you'd like to unmute yourself and share your um, screen. Does that work? You're unmuted. Do you have a you screen? Have a screen? No, and you're very echoey. Oh, your screen is coming up now. Yes, perfect. Yeah, we can see your screen, Martin. That's perfect. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, the only problem is I can't hear you very well because your microphone keeps echoing what you're saying. <laughs> so um, it might be best to put your questions in the chat box as well, and then I can see them and read them out. It might be worth closing one of the two Martins because you, you, you've got two instances of Mark Martin up on Zoom. So if you close one of them, it won't echo, I think. 
Are you logged on to two devices, Martin? No, no I'm no, not. No, no. Um, so, Martin, is it just a case of going through identifications and what they might be on your photograph? Yes, yes, wait, 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 Perfect. Wait, 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 okay, wait, that's wait, fine. Wait, so I can I can do that. Um, firstly, I just want to say absolutely spectacular photo. It's really, really beautiful. Um, it, it captures everything so lovely. It's all in focus. Um, it'd be, I'd be interested to know what camera you use, if you don't mind writing that in the chat box. But um, right, so we're starting off the session with one of our beloved crusts. <laughs> Hurrah! Um, what we're looking at here is one of the Lecanoras. Okay, so this is a species belonging to the genus Lecanora. And I know that it's a Lecanora because it has those lovely jam tart fruiting bodies where the disc is a very different colour to the margin. Um, so the jam tart fruiting body is also known as the Lecanorine. That's the technical term uh, for the fruits. And the fruits are the apothecia. That's also the technical term. With Lecanoras, <clears throat> I never feel confidently identifying them in the field. There's a few that I feel I can do confidently, but then a lot of them, because there's so much overlap with features a lot of the identification comes from looking at the inside and um, so looking at the spores looking at the crystals so if you can recognize this to the genus Lecanora I would leave it at that for now at this level and um, there's plenty of other lichens to be working on <laughs> uh, that won't be making you pull your hair out but to, to yeah to progress with Lecanoras you need to be looking at crystals so you need a high powered microscope sort of up to a thousand magnification. So unless anyone else has got anything else they want to say, that's that's what, how I would conclude on these Lecanoras. Okay. I've got a question that I put in the chat, but is, is it only Lecanoras that have this jam tart um, appearance? No. <laughs> There are other species that have this jam tart appearance, but um, I'd probably say if you come across something that looks like this on a twig or on the trunk, probably I'd say seven or eight times out of 10, it's gonna be a Lecanora. But there's lots of species with this Lecanorine fruit. Thank you. Thanks Martin, that is a lovely photo. Did you, have, did you have another one to show or? Was that all you wanted to show tonight? Aha. Very good. More crusts. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, the middle one again. Um, we're in Lacanora territory. Um, I would not want to put a species name to it. Um, and then was this on a twig or was this on um on the trunk? Oh, you're on mute. Yeah, so was it, did you say this was on a twig? Yeah, okay, brilliant. Um, so I'm not entirely sure what this species is. Um, I'm thinking, so again, with large black fruits on a white phallus, um, and I can't actually tell if it's white or whether it's green. I mean, it's sometimes difficult to tell from the photograph, uh, but I would be, um, having to do chemical tests on it. So the first thing I'll do is a C test to see if it's uh, Lacedella eleochroma, which I don't think it is. And then just from the general jizz of it, I would be looking in um, Buellia territory. So B-U-E-L-L-I-A. But that's just from the jizz. <laughs> and I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to identify it um, I'd be taking a specimen and again, chucking it under the microscope. And if anyone can identify anything that I can't, please do shout out and um, correct or help me. <laughs> okay. No, I, I agree with you. It, it looks a lot to me like Buellia disciformis. Yeah. But without some tests, it's really not 
uh, not something that we can do. No. Not we can't say for sure. No. <clears throat> okay. Again, beautiful photos, Martin. Um, very impressed. Can we have a spelling of the one you think it is? Hopefully. Yeah, so uh, B U E double L I A. Thank you. And um, yeah, just to say, guys, like I'm really sorry if there's nothing that can be identified. Um, it's from photographs, it's never easy. You know, even with the specimen in front of you, it can be difficult at times. Um, but yeah, those big black fruits are quite characteristic of Wellias, but I don't want to give you an absolute identification in case I, uh, in case I'm wrong. I don't want to give anyone wrong information or misinformation. Thanks, April. Right. Um, Martin, was there one more? Oh, you like all the piddly little crusts, don't you, Martin? <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. Wow. This this one's more doable. Again, a really beautiful photo. Um, so with this, this species has got really small lobes, very small and leafy, quite compacted. It's got these beautiful cilia, which we call bicolorous, you know, they're sort of two-toned. And then if you look on the um, if you look on the tips on the underside, you can see that there's powdery ceridia um, so if you look on the right hand side in particular there's really good examples of it so right hand side is in the middle of the screen and that ceridia the powder is arranged on the underside of the lobes ah perfect on the underside of the lobes in a lip-shaped fashion um, instead of as a hood so I would be pretty happy in saying that's Fissia tenella. And so just a reminder, the ceridia are how the lichen reproduces, is powdery propagules that contain the fungus and the algae. So essentially a clone of its parent which can then blow off into its surrounding environment and colonize a new area. Very good. Morning. Thank you, April. Thank you, Martin. Mm. Okay. Uh, Martin, if you could stop sharing your screen now, please. Thank you very right. much. Um, um, shall we move if on? We'll have lots of photographs. If we cap it to maybe like three, each and then if there's any additional ones we can go back to them it's just so everyone gets a turn yeah perfect and if i've not explained anything proper please just message the chat or put your hands up um should we move on to mary next mary would you like to share your screen and unmute yourself Mary, was it you? Um, yes, I'm on the iPad. Do I just enlarge it? Yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, can I do that? Okay, so we live in a, uh, on the edge of the lawn. Just, I just collect these every day from the garden, basically, and the fields. So these are what I'm looking at. But what I'm really concerned about is this puzzle of um, this... Uh, subfloor. Well, I'm hoping that it's as near subfloridana. This one is incredibly coarse, you can see, and um, uh, quite tough. Yeah, really. Yeah. Um, it's it's obviously blown off the top of a tree. It's quite a big one, and I yeah. want to know if if these funny little things yeah. are the same the same species. Okay. Or, or whether, in fact, this is Usnea ker oh, Serotina, Keratina, I don't know quite yeah. how you say it. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to identify which Usnea species you've got, but I can give you some tips on how to identify Usnea subfloridana and Usnea serotina, um, if that would be helpful, because there's some quite key features. Yeah. So I'm going to start really broad for everyone. So an usnea 
is a genus of lichen that is fruticose in appearance, so very shrubby. <clears throat> it attaches to the substrate, so whatever, is, whatever it is it's growing on, by this thing called a holdfast, like what you get in seaweeds. And then usnias are green all the way around um, because of how the algae is arranged. The algae is arranged everywhere. But the key feature to identify all usnia species is that if you pull them apart, if you break the thallus, so the thallus being the body of the lichen, if you break it apart and look at it down with your hand lens, all usnias have this thing called a central cord. And you can tell because it's just a darker area in the center and then lighter fungal tissue on the outside. So that's how we know we've got an usnia. There are beard lichens. <clears throat> now, a, a common species of usnia, particularly down in the southwest, is usnia subfloridana. It's probably one of the commonest usnias that you've got. You know, if you've got subfloridana, if it has a blackened base, so the base, the holdfast, is completely black, and then it's highly branched. And then if you look closely with your hand lens, it's got these ceridia. So these areas, these oval areas, which are comprised of powder. And then coming out of the powder are tiny little fingers, which we call the ascidia. So ascidia are vegetative, just like the ceridia, but they're fingers. Now in the, in the keys, you might come across, sorry if this confuses anyone, but just for now, keep acidia in your head. <laughs> but in the keys, you might come across the term acidia morphs. Now, if you come across that, you see the acidia bit, you know that it's little fingers, so that's all that matters. But they call them acidia morphs in subfloridana because they're not true acidia because they're coming out of the powder. It's not a true extension of that upper cortex. So yeah, sorry, in summary, Usnea subfloridana, black and base, powdery, oval powdery patches with fingers coming out of them. Okay? Yeah. For Usnea serotina, this is probably the most recognisable <laughs> of all the Usneas, um, one of them. And the reason for this is that if you pull apart the thallus, if you pull it apart and then look at the central cord, the central cord is pink. It's the only usnea with a pink central cord. All the others are grey. Great. Is there any confusion about what a central cord is? Is anyone unsure? Or does that kind of make sense? Because I'm just thinking I might be able uh, to... Oh, I've got one other question. Do the... I mean, does... Uh, you know... I'm not really sure about the growth patterns of lichens. I mean, in, in the subfloridana, how is it really? Are the branches very chunky right from the start, or are they quite fine? And then the whole thing, like yeah. a tree trunk, gradually thickens. Yeah, that's right. So um, when they're young, they start off incredibly thin and incredibly, yeah. spooky, you know, to the point where sometimes they just look like bread. And then yes. as they age, they get um, wider in diameter. But what I will say is that when you're tackling usnias or any lichens in general, be kind to yourself. You know, don't try and identify an immature, young, piddly specimen. You know, lichens are hard enough to identify when they're in good nick, <laughs> when they're in good condition. Um, so if you find something that looks like it's dying, doesn't look right, honestly, discard it. Don't even look at it. If you find something that's really young, again, discard it, don't look at it. Try and find yourself a better example of what you're trying to identify um, because then you're much more likely to get a correct identification. Um, what was that asnia that when you pull it apart, it's pink? So it's serotina with a C. Thank you. It's okay. Mm. I'm just trying to work out how to group. Ah. And can I ask you another one as well? Yeah, that's fine. Um, which is this, I'm I'm hoping this one is uh, Calicaris, uh, Ramelina Calicaris. And I've recently discovered something that looks similar. There's just this tiny, tiny bit. Yeah. That 
fallen on the ground, and I'm thinking that might be um, fastigata, is it? Fastigiata? Yeah. So again, uh, it's really difficult for me to tell through the video. Um, so we're moving away from Usnias now into Ramelinas. So Ramelinas, again, a very common fruticose genus, so a shrubby genus. They are, are green around the entirety of the lichen, again, because of how the algae is arranged. But instead of being circular in cross section, they it looks like it's been flattened in a book. So they're more oval in cross section. They're very flattened. The thallus is flat, not circular. And ramaliners do not have a central cord. So that's how you know if you've got a ramaliner or not. I hope that makes sense to everybody. So again, I'm going to struggle to tell which one you've got, um, Mary, but if you've got Calicaris, Calicaris has this beautiful channeled phallus. Yes, it has got that. I just very channeled, to... like so to the point where it's a like almost like a canal. Um Isn't showing it. If you could keep it still, so so I can't see the channels on that. Bottom I left. I wouldn't say it's channeled enough. I think that's probably Ramelina fastigiata. Oh, okay. Um, but again, take that with a pinch of salt. Um, so it looks so like so how I imagine with, with Calicaris, how I tell what I tell people is if you like roll out a long bit of Play-Doh <laughs> and then stick your thumb in the middle of it and do a massive groove with your thumb. That's the sort of channel that you're looking for. So it's, I see what you mean. It's very irregular. Um, and it's got like a, almost like little grooves down the middle, but yes. I'm not convinced enough that it's channeled enough for Calicaris. And the reason right. I'm saying fastigiator is because you've got those little Shrek's ears at the tip. So the fruiting bodies of fastigiator are always on the tips. They're always terminal on the lichen. Okay. Um, have you looked at a photograph of Calicaris on the internet? Yes, I have. I mean, I have got some that are, have a more pronounced channel. Yeah. It's just that they're a bit dried up and so that's a I, fresh one. Yeah, now I'm seeing it still, like I'm about 99% sure you've got fastigiator mm. there. Yeah, and it's a it's got much thinner lobes as well, and it's a lot more spindly. Oh my gosh, more spindly! And, yeah, oh. and then the one on the left looks like Usnea. Uh, sorry, Ramalina farinacea. Yeah, with the Yeah, I reckon that's farinacea. Yeah, brilliant. Ah, yeah, okay. Beautiful specimens. Well, I just—I mean, I just collected these ones today. I mean, it's just—they're um, just. Uh, absolutely incredible everything and I'm puzzle and puzzle and puzzle but I'm getting there with some of the more simple ones <laughs> thank um, you you'll get grip to grips with them over time but can I say with the calicaris so it took me about three years to find that species and I had so many specimens of fastigiata thinking oh could this be calicaris could the, is, is this channeled enough to be calicaris mm. And then I saw Calicaris and I was like, wow, okay. Like there's honestly, when you see it, you absolutely know what it is. Um, there's no shadow of a doubt with regards to that channeling. So Great. yeah, okay. so keep at it. You'll come across it in no time. I believe in you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks, Mary. Yeah. Okay, um, that, that's yes that's me done really <laughs> okay I'm, I'm gonna mute you again if that's okay and then biddy if we could go to you next because i think you had some usnia photos as well yes and i'm sorry about the absence of my video i think what happened was i got my camera loaded up to the machine to upload the photos and i think it's kind of decided that that's the video it wants to do and I've tried pressing a hundred buttons to say, look, you really don't want to be using that video, but it's not happy. So short of rebooting things. So I I think it must have, I thought it was in the Devon Lichen chat, but um, it obviously, it wasn't. Um, and it must have therefore been, I think, at the Twig Identification Day that someone had brought 
what I would have called as a nose near Florida. And, so, and then there was a bit of a discussion about whether it was actually sub Floridana. Yeah. And as I hadn't done any homework before today, can you hear me all? Yeah. I thought, right, I will see if I've got some specimens and check whether they're Florida or sub Floridana. Because I hadn't realized that the sub Floridana actually had the like the disc sometimes. Yeah. Um, and even the BLS website is a bit. Mm. Anyway, so I dug out two and I took photographs of them and I looked at the holes cast and all this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And I think I've convinced myself that they're both specimens of Ursnia Florida rather than one of them's Ursnia sub Floridana. Um, although when I was looking at them, I was like, oh, I think the hold fast is slightly different, but they are very old specimens because they've been lying around at the bottom of my pile of things that I found blown over in Newbridge. Yeah. So then they've even, you know, they've lost their colour and all that sort of thing. But apart from that, they're quite nice. So yeah. I decided one had much smaller apothecia than the other. One yeah. was kind of two to six millimetres and the other was three to 12 millimetres. Yeah. One that the hold fast was dark and a bit smoother with some horizontal cracks and the other one was dark and rough. But then when I looked at them side by side, I thought, yeah, I think you're inventing. Anyway, so here, here is, you can, you can see my screen and yeah. I'm going to zoom out so you can see the two side by side. You can see they've lost their colour a bit. Yeah. Um, and can I, oh gosh, it's being a bit awkward. I click and grab. So great photos, Biddy, firstly. Um, well, I just got myself, because you'd all said that the thing to get was a TG something, uh, uh, Olympus yeah. tub. And I got a very old one, a TG4, on eBay just before Christmas. Good for you. Um, and yeah, you um, <laughs> I, I'm not entirely sure that the super, super, super macro is working, but the in between one's doing fine. Yeah. Um, so there's something funny going on with the Zoom. Now, I don't think the guy sold it to me. I doubt he was trying to cheat me because he said I took about five photos, chucked it back in the water and never used it. And it came all beautiful in its box, you know. But anyway. Um, photos. So as to which Osnia it is, <laughs> I'm not going to be able to identify it for you. <laughs> no, no. Well, I, I'm, I'm Unfortunately, sure. it's not Florida, Osnia, Florida. Um, so with Osnias, a lot of people see an Osnia and if it has fruiting bodies, they think it's Osnia, Florida. But the main feature about Osnia Florida is, yes, the fruits, but also it doesn't have any ceridia or acidia. The branches are completely smooth. And can you see on your branches, they're very irregular? So, where am I? Can you see my mouth? I'm not quite you sure. You see, they're like the, the branches have got little warts all over them. Yeah. Very lumpy bumpy. Yeah. You won't get that with us near Florida. It's completely smooth. And in addition, the fruits are so abundantly fertile. It's like a little compact fertile Osnia. It's just like a little, it's just lovely. It's really, no. really tidy, not scraggly at all. Um, whereas this this thing's whatever it is, is all over the place. Oh. Well, you've blown my mind off because I was sure that these ones with the sort of witch's whiskers with the big sundials with the spikies around them like an enormous sunflower. Yeah. But what um, are they if they're not April? Because everyone else has been lying to me. A lot of usnias, a lot of usnias become fertile with those big sunshine discs. Do they? The little oh. tentacles that are coming off. So but if you go to the usnia key, um let's go to the correct part but if i go to like the bls website it should say no acidia no cerebia you can't go on the fruits unfortunately yeah not cerebia or acidia but small pointed branchlets yeah and then when on this one there was a, a Welshy one somewhere. Where's the Welshy one gone? Um The Lichens of Wales, that one. Yeah. So did they, that... had, they had a little sub picture of the surface. Yeah. Um 
And I think I migrated there from here, so. Oh, well, you've just blown the head off. Yeah. Hey, you can't do that because. So if you go on the internet and type in fertile Osnia subfloridana, for example, mm. you'll see that any of the Osnias can produce these fruiting bodies. So it isn't a key identifying feature, if that makes sense. Look, when I asked for your opinion, April, I didn't want you to tell me I was wrong. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of like, I'm, I'm kind of quite, so this thing that I've been saying is my favourite, this one. It can still be your favourite. It can still <laughs> be my favourite, but here we are. Wait First until you see the... true Osnia, Florida. It is low absolutely water, spectacular. Here it says, main wainstone with low water bumps, but Ceridia and Acidia are completely absent. So these water bumps. Yeah. That's on the Florida, according to that picture. What's, where, where are you reading that? Can you can you see my screen? I'm not quite sure what you're seeing now. Um, uh, it hasn't changed. Ah, ah. So if I stop screen share, sorry. So I've been, and now I'm going to have to screen share again. And this time I'm going to select this one. So this is from the whaleslichens.org.uk. And this says, Osnia, Florida, main stem with low water bumps, but Ceridia and Acidia are completely absent. And then on the right, Subnia Floridana. So I've never seen it with those little lumpy bumps before. Oh. It's always like very, very smooth. Fred, what do you think? He doesn't like Osnias. It's no good asking no, Fred about No Osnias. one does. But even, even just looking at what you've got, um, Viddy, it just doesn't have the, it's just the fruits aren't compact enough. It's very, um, it's very, Osnia, Florida is very neat, very tidy. Mm. Was this on a, did it, was it on a fallen twig? Well, to be honest, this one was so long ago. Yeah. Um, uh, are you seeing any of my screen now, Pazan? Okay. No. No. Sorry, sorry. sorry. Mm. it's all been a bit, a bit drunken today. Um, so these, <clears throat> these two, that I was convinced, well, one of them must be Florida and then maybe this one was quite a bit smoother on the right. Yeah. And then when when we're looking in here, so this is always the bit of a debate of when is it a sticky outy thing and when it's a bit of an acidia. Yeah. And you said, oh, it's a matter of size. So these warty bumps here are warty bumps or are they serrated? Yeah, so they're not they're not quite projected enough to be acidia. Um, but I would say they're more like warts, yeah. They're warty bumps. And and none of them, sorry, it's really hard to, the zoom controls keep popping up in front of my, where I want to slide around on the page. Mm. <laughs> it's almost impossible. I'll, I'll stop sharing. Right. Well, my mind is completely blown. Um, and all those things that I've identified as, as near Florida, I'm going to have to just go and eat my, eat my hat. Have you collected specimens? Well, no, I try and I put these ones I did when they'd fallen down. Um, and have have you typed text. in Osnia, Florida on Osnia, Florida on the internet? Mm. Yeah. Can you see how how compacted the the fruits are? Like it's so abundantly fertile and the discs are always massive in Osnia, Florida. Let me show you my screen. Well, certainly all the things that I'm seeing here look very like the things that I found, but- um... Can everyone see my screen? Yeah. Yeah. Can people see how humongous these discs are? When you say big, that's not very helpful to the scale, but um, are we talking a centimeter? Well, um, oh no, sometimes but I've seen them like up to two centimetres. They're absolutely ginormous. <laughs> okay. um, but if you look at this photo where my, this one here, mm -hmm. it's just so densely fertile. Yes. So um, densely fertile. 
I feel like the ones I've got here with them. It's very, it's very compacted. The thallus is very tufted. Like the main branches aren't very big. So, okay, so main branch is stumpy. Yep. Very, very, very tufted. Compacted. And where tufted. did you collect it? Was it on Dartmoor? That would have been at Newbridge because that's a very old one. Right, so that doesn't And matter. I thought I found one you um, definitely get it there. the other day and I shared it to, ooh, I think I shared it to the one of the groups when I found it near Oakhampton and I was so pleased that I'd found it near Oakhampton Railway Station. But maybe yeah. it was just any old us near with a fruiting body and I, mm. and I have to go and start all over again. Yeah. Really cool. <laughs> Sorry, you just can't, I can't be convinced. <laughs> no, but I think I've learned something. I really I have think that's something. a huge learning point for us all because you're not the only one, Biddy, that was uh, <laughs> that was going down that road with us near Florida. So, so yeah, there's, there's a few of us here that can um, can learn a lot from that. Yeah. I mean, us near is a little difficult, and I really haven't, I, I always, it's one of the things I keep saying, I'm going to make a study of this and because... You can't half do us near you've got to do them one hundred percent or else you'll uh, yeah you're gonna struggle. They're their own thing, aren't they? And, and do you know what? I think honestly, I can count on one hand the number of times I've seen us near Florida on Dartmoor. It's it's, it's a it's a real rare and declining species. Yes. Um, if you need to get your, if you want to get your eye in for us near Florida. I can tell you the most spectacular tree, and I think we counted like over a hundred thalli all on the mm. branches. Um, mm. I can put it in the group chat if people want to go and hunt it down. But it was I was I've never seen it like so much in my entire life because it's very much a canopy thing. It likes the light, but it's so sensitive to air pollution, so mm. sensitive, the tiniest bit of nitrogen pollution, and it's gone. Um. So unfortunately, it is declining across Dartmoor, and I don't know. I'm not. I think its status might be near threatened. Actually, let's have a look. It's going down. Yeah, it's near threatened. This species, and if you look on the um, so I'm just I've just gone on the British Lichen Society website. Just share my screen quick. I think I've got one in my collection at home. Um. I'm not at home at the moment. So can you? So um, if you look at these, the the map, um, um, everything in blue is its uh, 1960 to 1999 range, um, and then everything 2000 plus is its existing range. So you can see that it's massively constricted. Yeah, and I think I might have even reported that as near Florida because I just assumed I was right because that's what I'd been told. So. Yeah. Oh, I hang my head in shame. No, you mustn't. And I'm happy uh, to look at the specimen as well if you would like me to. But um, I'm pretty. No, 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 because it was really just a learning thing, actually. Um, yeah. Can I show you another picture then? Well, we're yeah. on these. Please All right. Yeah. I'm going to show you this one, which was what I found. Near I agree with what Fred says. Osnias are. I've... That looks good for Osnia, Florida. <laughs> But that's um, what the others look like when I first picked them up. Did it have ceridia? Did it have acidia? Um, is it ceridia? To be honest, this one was just before I got my train. Then I <laughs> wandered over to this tree thinking, I wonder if I could find some of those near Florida on that tree because there's a lovely, lovely oak tree in the dip. Yeah. And um, if we can zoom in. And I, I wasn't really kind of trying to identify at that point. So can um, you see how that's that main branch coming off there, smooth? Well, it's got um, bits I'm it. seeing bumps on that one too, um, and here. Okay, maybe you're right. I would want to check that and just check that they're not ceridia. Did what? While you're all chatting, I'm going to look on my camera and see if I've got a photograph of this one taken with the swanky camera as well as just the if, if you zoom access. in, so where that that disc is in the center to the branch just to the right. So if you go a bit further up. Sorry, so um, is my mouse in the right place now to zoom or further up? Further up. That one? So, no, further down. The little tiny disc below it. Yeah. If you just go sort of two o'clock, that branch there looks like it might have got acidia on it. Yeah, they're a bit out of focus, aren't they, on this? 
So I think this was just taken with my phone, but I think I've got some. I might have a photograph I've taken with a swanky camera, but it was like the first day I was using it. Mm. So I feel like I've had more than my fair share. My mind is blown, but I have learned something. Thank you, April. I'll, I'll okay. And stop. towards the tips as well, they look slightly cerebral. So yeah, I would just double check. <gasps> so much to learn. So, and so can you see how compacted that was? Well, to That's be honest, cool. the other ones looked a bit like that. April, it's just they've been squashed. So now I'm I'm quite confused about what contacted is, but I'm gonna I'm gonna do some more learning. Yeah, mm -hmm. you can collect lots of them and yeah, shove them under someone's nose. Yes. Thank you. Okay. It's a it's a great example as well of, of what you need to record in a photograph, isn't it? Because mm -hmm. I mean you want to take a picture of the whole thing. Um which is quite helpful, but actually a really helpful thing would be to have a really nice detailed picture of whether the uh, the branches have acidia or are smooth or not. And that, that really helps a lot, doesn't it? Just little things like that. And the size of the apothecia, I think, is is usually helpful as well. Yeah, yeah. there's lots to go on there. And I'm now reminded of, of April in my early days of knowing her saying, don't bother trying to identify Osnias to anything other than genus level. Yes. <laughs> but That's I kind of great. I know that we all want to move on a bit beyond that now. So yeah. they are um, as Lindsay yeah. said. Thank you. So um should we go to Charles now? I've got um I've got two photographs for which I think probably aren't lichens. Um but we're very close to the lichens. Um, so if I can um, share my screen and I think I don't know, is that is that coming up? Yeah. Um, yes. So, Interesting. Sorry. Yeah, I don't. It was on a small, small. Uh, sorry, uh, just stop the uh, stop the thing here and just go back a bit. Yeah, there. Um, it's, it's probably fungus, is it? I don't know. Any any ideas, anybody? A fungus of some descript. Yes. Yep. yep. Oh, sorry. I'm not sure which one. No, mm. no that's, that's, that's fine. I just. Just wondered on that. Um, and that's the side view. But I think it was probably attached to something else. So this um, this is the other one. Um, now, if you, you can see the lichens on the sort of left hand, on the right hand side there. In the center, you've got these sort of like black patterning. And it's on, on the bark. And it's very small. I mean, each one of those little black marks, probably a millimeter. Mm. Um, my guess. My guess is that it might be slugs eating. I don't know, but has, has anybody got eating lichens? It could well be. So like <laughs> the mouth parts of mollusks, I think it's called the radula. Um, right. you, you can see like grazing patterns on lichens. Um, as to what that is, <laughs> I'm not entirely yeah, no, sure. I'm not, I'm not asking anything more than just sort of like, you know. Yeah. But that, that's the sort of pattern coming. you can get on lichens sometimes when they've been grazed by slugs or snails. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. So um, the other the other ones I've got um, is a series of photographs um, which came from Scotland, um, and they're you know I don't, it's just a really exciting space. Um, to get to to see to see. I'm just going to see if I can find them. Um, I thought I had them on the screen here, but let's just get rid of that. Um, and uh, oh, no, no. I'm going to I'm going to no. I'll, I'll pass I'll pass on those because it'll take a bit of time to find them. I thought I'll, I'll okay. I'll leave I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Okay. I'll come back. I'll come back if there's space at the end with some other bits and pieces. Brilliant. Um, Thanks, Charles. Can I just say, great eye for detail. If that was a slug radula, you know, making that mm. little pattern, well spotted. <laughs> what it brings. Well, it's, it, it was over, you know, over the over the tweet generally. There was lots of that sort of 
thing going on. So I presume that's what it was, but I just sort of like wanted sort of confirmation that here we've got lichens which are missing rather than... Uh, yeah, yeah. I see where hmm. you're going with that. I'm going to have to <laughs> keep keep an eye on things on the twig that aren't lichens now as well. <laughs> yeah, it's sort of like, yeah, yeah. Um, Sonia, can often go, go to you next? Oh, sorry, Fred, did you want to say something? No, no, nothing. Can Sonia. Right. Can you see my screen? Yep. Not yet. Not yet. Oh, I did. Sometimes um, there's a little bit of a lag. Right. Um... Go back. Uh, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Ah, is that it? It's coming. It's loading, yeah. Brilliant. Now, what? What I've actually done is I've done similar to a presentation, which I would normally do to the lab group. Yeah. Um, so I suppose it will give people an idea of what we've been doing in the lab group. <laughs> we should probably um, just explain that the lab group is the Lichen for Absolute Beginners online course that the British Lichen Society runs. So um, you don't need to be a member to to go on this course. Um, so we can give you further details of how to get your name on the list if you're interested later on. Can you right. start that at any time? They run on particular dates. So you put your name down and then, you know, a course would start when a tutor is available. And I know I'll be doing one over summer, summer or autumn. Yeah, I'll um, be doing mine with Fred. <laughs> so, that's it. <laughs> so I'll, I'll crack on because I've got a few a few slides. We've been I've been learning how to do these uh, PowerPoint presentations, so I'm new to this. So I've been learning as I go along. So I I found I did a walk in this area you can see on the left, um, and found a corticolus, which means on the tree, um, lichen. Um, and this was just off Telegraph Hill. Up um, in the Exeter Forest area. The arrows are pointing to two um, dev old Devon Green Lanes, which are absolutely beautiful to walk along. Um, they're quite, uh, the one on the lower one is quite steep. Um, uh, so it's quite difficult walking if anybody tries to do it. But it, the, the trees are lining it are quite old. Um, so very interesting area. I'll, I'll go a bit quicker because I know that there are other people to go. Um, basically, uh, found this crustose lichen on this ash tree on the right. That's the picture on the left. Is what the what lane looks like, um, which isn't. That's the better bit to walk on, which is is just beautiful. Um, so the lichen was on both um, the upright bark and the horizontal bark, and on the shaded side of the tree. Um, as you can see, unfortunately, I forgot my good ruler. So I always have, thank you, Biddy, a piece of paper in my phone, because she suggested this, um, tucked away just in case I ever needed it. So this is my makeshift ruler, which I have with my phone all the time. Um, so the thallus was roughly, as you can read, two by 2.5 centimetres, olive green brown, irregular edge. Um, I'm not sure if it was significant that it's got paler green or tan color in places, um, but it was definitely waxy looking. Mm -hmm. the, this is a closer up picture. So the apothecia were mainly, I, I, this was a bit of a learning curve for me. So I've stated it as I did it the first time. So I called the black fruiting bodies lecidine. Um, because I, I did see some with a little bit of a hole at the center, but I, not all of them had it in the fact that it was just the odd one that I found with a hole. And I thought, is that significant or is that not significant? Um, so at this stage, um, I just noted it um, and it was difficult to pick it up on the pictures um, that I took. 
And but you can see the picture on the left shows the um, black 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 edge to the thallus when it was meeting other um, lichens. Um, there were lots of white dots all over the pseudocephaly, all over the thallus, um, which I think is quite distinctive. I'm hoping I've identified this correctly. Um, and some areas of the lichen on the left, unfortunately that one, I couldn't get a picture in focus very well, was more flecky. And that that area didn't seem to have any fruiting bodies. I don't know why, um, whether it's because it was younger or just doesn't always have fruiting bodies in an area. Um, so I'm sure April will enlighten me. Um, unfortunately, I had forgotten to take my chemicals, but I don't think it really mattered on this occasion if I've identified it correctly. Um, I tried to identify this from Dobson and I got stuck. Um, and I think the main reason was, as I've written, that I described the fruiting bodies as lecidine and they are actually um, described as flasclate perithesia. So I should have looked up in the perithesia section of the crustose um, section in Dobson. So I went to Nimis, which is the guide that Lindsay goes on about and has given everybody details of how to get hold of. So I've just, um, I've elaborated actually because I thought people probably haven't come across this before, how I got to where I got to um, with the questions. So um, the highlighted areas are the ones that I followed. So that took me to the next page um, so that I followed it all the way down and got to the perennial species in the end. Um, I won't go through it all unless, well, people can always look back on it. So I won't go through all this because um, it will take too much time. And then I went back to Dobson looking at perennial and went through the key on the left there um, and got it down to the last um, note you can see, um, number four, says the parathesia about one millimeter in diameter or the parathesia up to 0.3. Now, because I didn't take a decent ruler, <laughs> I couldn't, I thought they were probably about 1.5 was the biggest one that I saw. So then I thought, right, which one is it? Could it be macrospora or is it the chlorospilla? So I'm sort of leaning towards macrospora um, and just hoping actually that I just got the genus right. Um, so what do you think, April? Firstly, I just want to say how impressed I am with you documenting all the different stages with your ID. It's really, really impressive. And what I also really liked is how you used two different resources as well. You used Nimis in combination with Dobson. And I think whenever you use the field guide, you always have to supplement it with something else, especially if you want to get from an unknown to the genus. Um, you're absolutely right with Pyrenula. You know, we're well done for recognising that it wasn't a lecidine apothecia. It was a parathesia in the end. Yeah. Um, for those of you who are unsure to tell the difference between the two. So lecidine apothecia are those with um, when the disc is the same color as the margin. And if those fruits are black, they look very similar to parathesia, but you tell them apart in that fact that parathesia have this little pinprick in the top, which we call an osteol. And parathesia look like little blueberries. That's how I've described them. Whereas lecidine apothecia look more like black wine gums and they have a disc, not that central point. So that's how you tell them apart. But it's not always easy, um, <laughs> Sonia, is it, to, to actually spot those yeah. little objects in the top. Um, so when you first showed the photograph, I just thought pyrenula chlorospilla. It just had that vibe to it. The fruits were quite, um, they were quite close together. Um, whereas I find with macrospora, they tend to be further apart. And because you measured them at about 0.5 millimetres, um, it's kind of hard to know exactly which one it's, it is. But to me, it looked like chlorospilla. Right. But you, honestly, you always find them growing next to each other. So there would have been macrospora somewhere on that tree. <laughs> so is this one of those occasions where you need to test because of the K plus red crystals that I've and the in the parathesial wall? Do you know what? I've never, um, so 
with the between them but when I'm out in the field I can normally tell the difference between macrospora and chlorospilla quite easily without the chemistry because when you're in the southwest both of those species are completely abundant so if there is one example I'm unsure of I can guarantee I'm going to find it on the next smooth bark tree right okay so no I've, I've never actually done the the k test to split the two but to do that you'd have to do a cross section because it's right. the crystals in the paratheseal wall mm. which i've just learned today so thank you for mm. that <laughs> and the, <laughs> right. the paratheca as you, as you pointed out they're, they're they're two different sizes really and i think um macrospora um, often uh, is they're more widely spread out and usually greener, I, I think. And the um, chlorospilla tends to be sort of more tan. At least that's the uh, the way I've, I've normally said. But as you say, they they often grow um, together, really, don't they? Which is interesting. Yeah, I think what you said then, Fred, like so, how macrospora that the more scattered the fruits, whereas yeah, chlorospilla they're, they're quite, mm. slightly more closer together. Mm. Um, right, and then yeah, I've not really, in as Craig said, the color as well, but mm. okay. Super I just threw the last. I just <laughs> threw the last slide in because I just wondered what the was what, what the one next door was, but I think I'll let somebody else go because we're probably running out of time. <laughs> I haven't. Actually, it's quite. This in. is quite interesting, sorry, because what you've got oh, there is, I think it's the perithecia have dropped out, so you're just seeing oh. the remains of the, the back of the perithecia. And those are the uh -oh. ones which I'm tempted to say that's chlorospilla rather than macrospora. And they do seem to all do this at the same time. That That's my impression. What do you think, uh, April? Yeah, so Fred, completely agree. The perithe That's a dead pyrenula and the perithecia have just dropped out. But if you yeah. look on the left-hand photo, you've actually got both macrospora and chlorospilla growing together. Yeah. So oh. if, if you take your mouse over to the left-hand side of your screen... That's it. If you go down, down, slightly to your right, that, I would say that is a really good candidate for macrospora. Sorry. Okay. Yes. This one's macrospora. I can't see the screen. It's um. It says it's black. Oh. Ah, there we go. I've got it. I've got it. Yeah. So where okay. your mouse is now, well, was. Oh, I've gone black. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I've oh, I've lost it. Uh, oh, hang on. There we go. <laughs> okay, it's right. just loading for me. Uh, sorry there about we that. go. Right, so where your mouse is now, I would say that is Pyrenula macrospora. Can you see how the fruits are really quite big? Yeah, yeah. And then if you head sort of 11 o'clock up past the dead Pyrenula into the next thallus. Oh, I've lost my mouse. Yeah. All oh, right. There that we one. go. I would say that's chlorospilla. Ah, right. Can everyone see oh. the difference between the two? Yes, yes, much smaller and yeah. More Would you agree, Fred? Those together. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Oh, I'm glad I showed that last picture then because I was just thinking, is that another one? Because I couldn't work mm. it out because it didn't have the shiny surface. So I'm glad you, I've learned something else as well. That's great. They're a really lovely group, pyrenulas. And when you start yeah. into like Wales and the Lake District, and especially Western Scotland, Southwest Ireland, you start getting these oceanic pyrenulas. So things that you only get in really high rainfall situations on smooth bark. So really right. high quality woodlands, you know, real hazelwood specialist sort of species. And they're just absolutely wonderful. Completely gorgeous, you know, like Pyrenula levigata, Pyrenula occidentalis. Yes, uh, they're gorgeous. Hibernica, right. which is called blackberries and custard, mm. <laughs> um, yeah. blackberries and snot because of the colour of the phallus, yeah. as Dave Lamacraft says. Okay. What, what, would have, what would have caused the Pyrenula to die? Was that, would that have been. Um, not sure. Have, Anything. Yeah, yeah not, I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. I have a theory that that's actually the way they grow. You know, ah. they, they, they all seem to be abundantly fertile, don't they? And you often get um, little black dots, especially around the edges, which are the um, uh, uh, vegetative, vegetative um, uh, pycnidia, 
uh, on the edges uh, sometimes. But often you get whole patches where where they just seem to have fallen out in that way. And I wonder if they it's just part of their growth pattern that they'll fall out and then the next load will come from underneath it, perhaps. I don't know. I think it's a long experiment worth doing, I think, to find out how they change over time. Yeah. Good. Thank wow. You. Thanks, Sonia. That was really amazing. Um, I think we've still got a couple more to go. So, Sheena, shall we have you next? All right, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, so, and we can see your slide. I think we've seen this one before. So we've got a tree, a uh, hawthorn, well-pruned hawthorn in my back garden. So out I went and saw the cilia and thought, oh, good. Could, so it could have been Fiscia leptalia, adscendens, or tenella. Um, I didn't have many clues, so I had to revisit it and... Uh, the, the Leptalia, the book tells me, has got lots of fruiting bodies, apothecia, so this one didn't have any of them, um, but it was ceridiate. Now, to me, it looks as if it's lip-shaped rather than hooded, um, but I, you know what, there's a lot of spikes on that tree, and it, it's, uh, so I didn't get in too close, and so that's what I thought it was, Tanella, because it didn't seem to have the hoods. It, it, it's um, that to me looks as if it might be the the lip shaped one. Um, so th the other thing that I considered was which other ones have got this the cilia, and I just found one more, a different genus, which was Anaptitia, Anaptitia, and it said it was much bigger. So hopefully it would be able to tell that one f from the Tanella and um, the, the other three. I don't know. Um, and then again, there are, um, I've got a whole list of 10 Fiskias here. So yeah, I can manage the ones with the cilia, but the next challenge is how on earth am I going to sort all the others out? And that's me, I've done, <laughs> that's me finished. Yeah, brilliant. And all of your photos are lovely, Sheena, especially, you know, capturing, well, this last photograph, which really captures all the fe features fantastically. Yeah, um, so, yeah, I and I'm sure everyone else would agree that it is Fissia tenella. You've got those lovely lip shaped ceridia on the underside and you've got the cilia as well. Mm -hmm. um, so just two comments. Well, free actually. Um, so the reason we know it's um, a fissia, so a good shortcut to that genus, is that fissia species have a feature called maculae. And maculae basically means um, an uneven distribution of algae within the lichen. So it's very patchy. It's very mottled in appearance. So you have areas that are green by white, and then green again. I think it, it, it almost looks like a, a giraffe, you know, a giraffe's, giraffe's skin. So that's a really good, if you have something like that, that is sort of a blue green um, and then has this maculae all over it, then you're, in, you're probably going to be in fissier territory. So that's my first point. My second point is you mentioned about fissier leptilia um, and how to recognize that because it's got lots of fruiting bodies. Um, Fissia tenella and adscendens can sometimes have lots of fruiting bodies, but the key thing about Fissia leptilia, so firstly you need to be by the coast, <laughs> roughly, um, the main thing about Fissia leptilia is that it has a complete absence of ceridia. So normally there's loads of fruits and it's quite a good way to recognise it, but it's the, the absolute absence of ceridia. Right, thank you. And what about the and Then I had a third point. Oh, Anaptitia ciliaris. <laughs> Eagle's claw is its common name. The way to identify this, it can be really difficult, especially if the specimen is degraded. But um, it lacks, Anaptitia lacks a lower cortex. 
So you can actually it's it's you can actually see the fluffy white medulla, which looks a bit like cotton wool on the underside. It's one of these unusual folios lichens that breaks the rules. It doesn't have a lower cortex. In addition, the cilia, they split at the end, which gives the sort of appearance. So not all the time they split, but I've seen quite a few specimens where the cilia split. And I think that's where it might get its name, Eagle's Claw. But it's a red listed species. I think it's endangered. Could even be no i think it's endangered and you only find it on sort of really old well-lit trees that have um sort of nutrient enriched bark or a small amount of nutrient enrichment so it's part of the um that xanthorian fisciatum community lovely thank you very much right. so i'll get rid of my shoe that's great. Thank you, Sheena. Yes. And Toby, do you have something to share? I'll mute myself. You said that, uh, on uh, Sunday that I could show something that was from a, a curbstone rather than a tree. Is, is that still yeah. appropriate? Go for it. If I can... Uh, I'll try. <laughs> well, let me find it. There we are. Yeah, so uh, this is just on a curbstone quite near my house that I walk the dog past very regularly. Um, and there are lots of these particular lichens um, on, on, on the curbs all the way up and down the, the road. Um, and I've identified it as Aspicius uh, calcarea. And I just wondered whether you agree. I've got a, a close up of it. Um, so it might be that one. Yeah, so that's it really close up, um, which to me looks very like what I'm seeing in, in uh, the Field Studies Council book, and I think also in Dobson, if I remember rightly. Um, so I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. or is that, If I'm taking you out of your comfort zone, please say, because I don't... Um... Well, and I'm just having to check Dobson. Um, but so... Firstly, I wouldn't say it's Aspicilia calcarea. Um, okay. Aspicilia, I think it is definitely an Aspicilia. Yeah. But calcarea tends to be on extremely calcareous surfaces. Right. Um, and also it is bright, bright white Aspicilia calcarea. Okay. However, I do think it is a different Aspicilia. Um, And I'm just trying to remember its name. Uh, so have a look at um, Caesiosporia. I think that might be more slightly more suitable for the habitat. So can you say that again? Caesiosporia. So C A E S I O. C A E S I O. I O. C I N. C I N. Okay. And then E R E A. Oh, E R E A. It, okay. just, it doesn't quite look white enough for the calcarea. It's, okay. You know, okay. Fred, what do you okay. think? Tempted by um, Aspicilia contorta. Contorta. What do you think? But it's one of those two. Is there a yeah. chemical test? I'm just looking now. I find contorta slightly green, like it's quite green. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, differs from Aspicilia calcarea by being greenish. Yeah, yep. definitely Aspicilia. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, at the moment, I'm only interested in getting the genus right. Actually. That's good. Yeah. Well, it's it's changed its name, uh -huh. by the way. It's Circinaria, I think now. That's you know, you blink and they change their names at the moment. Yeah, but that's just, Cecilia's good name. Yeah, I just um, so yeah, the, the habitat's quite important. So potentially seeing what other species were growing on the rock, um, will allow you to work out whether it's an acidic or calcareous rock. Oh, uh, okay. But I, yeah. I'm presuming it's going to be more of an acidic. 
Yeah, as I say, it's a curbstone, so it's you know. It's, um, but I can show you something else, um, which to me is quite interesting, and that is well. Let's go back just to the first photograph first. You can see this sort of funny uh, indentation here with the with which is a different uh, lichen. Yeah, and that's a close up of it. So I I don't know. That's a that's a different lichen, is it? Presumably. I'm uh, not 100 percent sure, but I do wonder whether it's a young aspicilia, but a different individual, which is why you've got that prophallus. Yeah. Well, I, I that this photograph was taken in April, and I went, well, I, I go back every I took another photograph just recently, it's not so good, but it shows that that, that second individual that second lichen seems to have kind of Disintegrated, almost sort of given up a fight in a way. Yeah. Ooh. Interesting. I, mean, I think that just highlights how dynamic lichens are, right? Yeah. Yeah. Great, Toby. Can you Thank go you. back every few months and keep taking photos? And we now we now yeah. want to know yeah. the story of this. Okay, I'll I'll continue the story another day. <laughs> yeah, we'll get a better photo. What you, what you might try, Toby, is uh, I'm I'm not entirely sure what the stone um, of that curb stone is. Is try a couple of drops of lemon juice and oh. see if you get any fizzing on it. Oh, on the stone, yeah, to see if what what. Uh... Yeah. But it's, yeah, okay. I'm not sure if it's an artificial material, actually. Uh, yeah. It's got a vague uh, concrete -y look to it. Perhaps, yeah. I'm, perhaps I'm just imagining that. Yeah, I mean, as I say, this is just one of a load of these uh, patches that are uh, on, on these curb stones by my house, yeah. Have you have you got the Do a Frank Dobson field guy, did you say? Yeah, 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 I've got it, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I think what Fred says, just, like, double-check your... You're in the right genus, hundred percent. Yes. Check your substrate. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. I'll stop sharing. Well done. That's great. Brilliant. Have we missed anyone who had something to show? Can you wave or? Oh, I've got. Well, I've got the. I've got the ones from Scotland. If I can quickly flick oh. through those, is more more as a sort of like idea of. Hold I'm on just for a second, Charles, because I think right. someone else was waving. Yeah, okay. Would you like to unmute yourself? I'm well, sorry, you're labelled as Lindsay Marne, but I know you're not. <laughs> oh, <it's> me. <laughs> oh, Nicola. Um, Nicola was yeah, waving. Me. <laughs> Hi. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I just had, um, I've obviously, I've got um, a lichen to show that I had for the labs group that I haven't finished the PowerPoint off, um, but it was one that I was just, I, I managed to ID the lichen next to it, but then the lichen to the side of it, I just, I don't even know how to start with it. So I just wondered if I could show that. Yeah, yeah. please do. Um, do you want me to do that now? Yeah. Yes, please. Um, so I will try and share again. One second. Can you see it? Yeah, we can see your screen. Um, so it was one that I found um, on a stone at a National Trust um, place. Um, and there were two, I think, two separate lichens together because it looked like there was the um, zone of contention um, going down the middle. And then almost like um, parts of the lichen on the right were sporadically in the lichen on the left yeah um and it was the lichen on the left i was struggling with so i might be wrong but the lichen on the right i thought i'm not even going to try and say the name i thought it was this one which is quite common yeah. did it go c plus i d i can't do chemical testing because i always have a baby strapped to me <laughs> oh, okay <laughs> so i'm struggling a bit to even take pictures at the moment um so looking on even just at your photograph the one on the right looked like the acrospora. Cool. Okay, so that one should be all right. But the one, the one on the left, I just, I don't know where to even start with it. So this is the, I'm pointing. You can't see me pointing. Um, 
this is the close up of it. Um, and it it almost looks like it has an indent, but then I don't know whether it's described as engulfed because they just end up looking like blobs. Yeah. Um, so I just didn't really know where to start with this one. Yeah, so <sighs> me neither. <laughs> <laughs> it's got lecanorine apothecia from the looks of it. So if you look at the young cluster of fruits, yeah, yeah, here. The, the margin looks slightly different colour to the disc, but then the margin becomes excluded. Um, but I, I wouldn't be able to put even a genus on it. I don't know about you, Fred. No, I'm definitely struggling here. Yeah. Um, I had another picture, but I took it with the lens of the light, and um, I think it made it worse. <laughs> Because the light obviously changes the colour. Um, go back. Can you go back to that photo again? It's like a light orangey. Um, I I describe it as kind of like a mixture of or rusty orange and then a kind of almost like a green white. It was like a mixture of colours almost. And go back to slide number seven again. Uh, seven. Yeah. So that's with the light. I think the light was almost making it look a bit strange yeah. in colour. Looks a bit green. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's unfortunately. Sorry. I think you're definitely in Lacanora territory. I'm sort of okay. wondering whether you've got like a dodgy polytropa or intricata or something. But they're yeah. normally green. Um, but I wonder whether something's going on with this because it's not ringing any bells at all. I always have this problem. Every, <laughs> every yeah. like, and I need to do what Fred says and stop trying to find odd things and start with <laughs> 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 no, um, I just get excited there. when you see something you don't really recognise at all. Yeah. I mean, I'm, not, I'm yeah. not very good at recognising anything at the moment, but when you see something unusual, it's like, oh, what's that? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm hoping to get the chemical testing. I did have um, one other slide, but I, don't, I probably don't have time to do that, do I? It's another thing where I don't know what it is. <laughs> Um, yeah, you can quickly show it. Um, so I have to stop there and start again. That's okay. Has anyone else got any more questions after after this set? Okay, just one more question after this. Two more, Martin and... Uh, sorry, I'm just trying to find on my... my thing. So if we take these last two questions after this, maybe, and then hand over to Fred. And One quite quick. You, you said during that that it was excluded, I think. Yeah. What does that mean? So it means like the discs, the disc in the centre sort of takes over the margin. So the disc becomes really big and excludes the margin. So you can't see the margin of the fruit anymore. Okay. That, thanks. Does that make sense? There's quite a few yeah. species that do that with excluded margins. Um, sorry, so this was just um, a lichen that I found on the tree, um, but again, I was trying to take it in a rush because my um, little baby was trying to wake up, <laughs> but um, I I sent it to Fred as well because I, I didn't know if I'm looking at um, a um, lichenicolous fungi or another lichen growing on the back of a lichen, but when, I don't know if I can zoom in, it's... Um, it was like black. All I can see is the the photograph tiles. I can't actually see the photograph. Oh. I don't know if that's okay. the case for anyone else. Let me try again. Sorry. Um, I really need to it. Yeah, uh, I just think I'm... Here we go. Can you see it now? Oh, yeah. So it was like um, just a load of black, almost like tar-like stuff. Um, and then in the centre of each like black blodule, there was like a kind of white, um, like a grey blob. I guess, um, almost like four light. So I didn't know whether maybe it was a lichen growing on the back of a lichen. Mm. Um, 
or whether it was like a Nicholas Fungi. Um, I yeah. don't know if you can even tell from that. I have no um, idea what that is, unfortunately. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. I just, I, I couldn't figure out what it even was. So um, I'll try and get some better pictures at some point there. Thank you. So. No, it's all right. Sorry not to be more help. <laughs> With all the difficult things, it's always worth holding on to the sample, putting it in a packet, because someday you'll know what it is, or somebody else might be able to tell you what it is. Um, you know, you can, if, especially if you have uh, um, a bit compound microscopy or notice there's some fruiting bodies or some things. Um, these things are, are very interesting puzzles to figure out, but it might take years to figure out what they are. So it just depends how patient you are, I think. Well, um, I just was going to ask on that point as well, because um, obviously I sent you a picture recently of um, like a Nicholas Fungi that I thought was the mark, and I'll say it again, but it's the orange one. Um, and um, there was only one specimen of that. And obviously you, um, Fred, mentioned to me that really they need to be ID'd with a microscope, but what do you tend to do if there's only one small amount of it? Because I didn't take it because I didn't think that was ethical practice. Um, mm. But if it has to be ID'd by a microscope, obviously me as a um, hobbyist isn't gonna take it, but if I was a professional, what kind of thing would you would you take it? Would you bring a microscope out to the field? How do you tend to tackle that? So it completely depends. So <clears throat> if I go out in the field and there is a lot of a certain species and I feel it needs collecting, then I'll collect it. If there is only a small amount of this species, so I see like one phallus, for example, throughout a whole entire woodland, and I'm like, oh, I think this could be something interesting. Um, I would collect a very, very small sample, like you know, sort of a, sometimes all you need is a fruiting body. Mm. Um, so that's, yeah, how I would go about collecting it. But I think there's enough that you can ID. Like, so if sort of at the stage that you're at, I would say if you come across like one, one specimen of one species throughout an entire woodland, I'd probably leave it. Um, unless you're actually going to really try and work it through and look down a compound microscope um but then if there's lots of it then I, I really encourage collecting um mm -hmm. I guess only you can make that judgment as to whether you think it's frequently encountered within the wood or less so okay thank you I don't know if that helps <laughs> yeah that's a good idea but it's good to know what you guys do yeah thank you. Yeah. Any more okay questions? I think we've got around everybody that wanted to show or share something. We are just after half past eight, and I'm conscious that we said this session would go until eight o'clock, but are you willing to hang on a little bit longer? Can I get some nods or some shaking of heads? Thumbs ups. Yeah, looks like looks like we're good to go, Fred. <laughs> All right, okay. Um, well, oops, Daisy, hold on a second. I've just um, spilled my glass. Um, all I wanted to do is um, just have a little description of, of um, chemical testing. So, um, uh, as we can see, a lot of lichens are quite difficult to identify, and it's very helpful, if you haven't done it, is to use the basic chemicals um, that lichenologists um, use in order to narrow down the choices of what things can be. Um, and these uh, chemical tests, um, well, uh, they originated in the 19th century, and the person who's associated with it is a bloke called William Nylander, who was a Finnish botanist who ended up in uh, Paris. And um, he actually described thousands and thousands of lichens. He, people used to send him samples from all over the world. He described them and put his name to them, basically, um, in exchange for telling people what the, their names were. And he is the person who figured out that uh, some of these chemicals actually made color changes. And what are they changing the color of? It's the, generally speaking, it's what's called the secondary metabolites, which are the 
um, the chemicals that lichens produce, which are not directly related to um, their reproduction or their growth and that kind of thing, but actually go out in, within the, the thallus in order to do various things like uh, protect them from uh, being eaten or as sunscreens, um, things of that nature. Um, and the, the chemicals that he came about, came, he came to, which are the most useful and still used to this day, are what's called K, which is um, either one of two chemicals. The usual one is potassium hydroxide, um, which uh, in previous times, in his day, was often called lye or caustic potash. Um, it's easy just to call it potassium hydroxide. Um, that's actually relatively easy to get hold of now on eBay and things like that. I don't think there's a problem getting it. Um, but there's another one which you'll find in a hardware shop often enough um, called sodium hydroxide, um, which is used for cleaning, I think, um, quite a lot. And the other name for it is caustic soda. And uh, it, uh, uh, these chemicals tend to degrade to um, washing soda. Um, it, it's, it, they're relatively safe in the environment. I mean, they don't leave um, nasty residue, so uh, they're not too bad. And the quantities we're using for identifying lichens are very small. Um, and the other one, of course, is C, um, which is sodium hypochlorite, as we know it more often enough, bleach. Um, and that's obviously readily available, but the big warning is that the bleach that you get um, might be adulterated to, uh, with other things to make it more efficacious. And one of the particular tricks which they had with bleach um, was to put a bit of K in it, essentially, um, so it can really mess around with your colour tests. Um, so the two brands which work for me, um, I think, are Parazone and Domestus still a lot of people recommend milton's um but i've never found that very effective myself and I've, I've yet to come across actually anybody who uses milton's i know that milton's um has a lot of salt in it um, which may not be particularly helpful or harmful at any rate um domestus and um parazone are widely available so i'd, I'd recommend going for that um, what you need is is eyedroppers, um, and the main health and safety warning is all these both these chemicals. You really don't want to get them in your eyes, um, you know, on your hands or in your mouth, that kind of thing. Um, so you have to be quite careful about it. You're using them dilute. Um, ideally, um, the health and safety would say would use uh, when you're preparing it is to use safety glasses, um, as I've got here. Um, these also work for UV, so they're quite handy to get. You get those, I think, from Wix or anybody else, um, um, typical safety glasses. Um, the main risks when you're making up um, your K is that it's exothermic. That means it heats up. When you add it with water, it'll give off heat. So if you, the best way of doing it is to have some water ready and then put your uh, your powder or your flakes which is what it normally comes into into the water and uh which is the safest way and the amount you need to do uh, by weight it's um uh 10 uh, percent of sodium hydroxide to 90 percent water so the best way of doing that is work out some water um, add in the amount of sodium hydroxide you want, and then bring in, bring add a bit more water to bring it up to the amount um, you need, which might be like a um, milliliters or um, whatever amount your eyedropper might be, or uh, fill a couple of eyedroppers. Um, both K and C degrade over time, so with K it it should last a few months. Um, but it's worth testing it. And the best test is always with um, Xanthoria parietina, which should go bright red when you place a drop of K on it. Um, with bleach, um, there's various tests you can say. Um, you can smell it, and if it smells like bleach, it's probably all right. But I would say if you're in any doubt, um, just use it to clean the loo and give yourself some more because the 
the bottles uh, you have a nice little eye drop dispenser so it's it's quite handy to do and it, it keeps your house clean at the same time so there it is um so <clears throat> um the next thing um which is worth mentioning is is uh, uh um having got your eye droppers of your k and c it's uh the thing to point out is it's a destructive test so when you put a drop onto a, your lichen, that bit of lichen is uh, probably going to die. So the idea would be to use a very small amount of uh, chemicals when you're testing your lichens and to be sure, um, for example, if, if, it's, if, if it's wet, um, chances are your K or your C will spread all over the place. Uh, which is not great for the rest of the lichen either. So what you can often do, and if we've got time, I might show uh, Becky Yar's video where she demonstrates her method, um, which I like to follow, I don't always do this, um, which is to remove a sample of uh, lichen and to test that on a piece of card or on a, um, she uses a, um, a microscope slide in order to do her tests. Um, there are other chemicals. <clears throat> um, the one that we sort of just mentioned there, which I think is really useful to have, um, if you're unfamiliar with rock types and you're looking at lichens on rocks, is some lemon juice. Um, you, if you drop a couple of drops of lemon juice on something that contains calcium carbonate, that is limestone, chalk, um, one of those rocks, <clears throat> it'll fizz. Um, often enough, not very strongly with lemon juice. Um, it has to be reasonably warm to get a good reaction. Also, um, concrete and um, artificial materials like cement and so forth, but not with plastic or anything like that. And not with acid rocks like uh, the kinds we get in our area, in particular in the southwest, um, granite and um, uh, mudstones and things like that, slates and what have you, um, schists. <clears throat> Um, but in, if you don't know, if you're not very familiar with rocks, that's a really nice, useful test because you get quite a different group of lichens, which often enough will live on calcareous rocks as opposed to acidic rocks, as they call them, um, like granite, which don't have calcium carbonate in them, um, limestone. Um, what more can I say about it? Um, so another thing that's worth having is to... I'd recommend um, when you're testing is to is to uh, practice before you get out in the field with some lichens that you're familiar with. Um, so, for example, Xanthoria paratina, it's always worth having a few bits and pieces just to see what happens when you put your K on it. Um, the other one uh, is worth having, for example, is... Uh, the one we looked at the other day, uh, Melanixia fuliginosa, which you often find growing on granite and black um, lichen um, with lots of acidia in the middle. And there you'd be looking inside of the, the body of the lichen at the medulla and to see if it turns yellow. Uh, another one, which is uh, for crustos lichens, which is worth having a look at, say, is Ocrelecria androgyna, which we talked about in, in labs, which is a, a crustose lichen you often find on trees and has yellow-green ceridia. And that one will turn um, scarlet with C. Um, then there's a, a quite difficult test to do. Once you get familiar with those ones, the more difficult test is a um, KC test, where you... Um, uh, uh, the best way of doing it is, I find, is to put a drop of K on the lichen you want to test, dab it with a piece of tissue, and it's important for all these tests, I think, to carry around a bit of tissue, and then apply uh, a bit of C to your bit of tissue. And, for example, um, you'll get an interesting reaction with Purchasaria amara, the one which you, the white crust, which you touch it and taste it, it tastes bitter. Well, to save you from having to taste it all the time and getting all that, but you can try the Casey test, um, which should give you a violet reaction, bright violet reaction that can be quite fleeting. Um, the other one 
um, you could try would be um, uh, hypogymnia fissodes, for example, and that will give you with a KC test um, a red reaction. Um, that's basically a very quick run through on the tests. Um, it's, as I said, it's if you have a test which doesn't give you a clear result, um, try it on a piece of tissue and see. And that often happens with, uh, um, oftentimes you, you do a test with K and nothing much happens. You might think, oh, it's turning a little bit yellow or you're not sure, if, or a bit green, and you're not sure if you're just seeing the inside of lichen because you're wetting it, or the bark underneath is colouring it, or some other factor is colouring it. But if you were to dab it with a tissue and look at your tissue instead, um, you see uh, if you get a colour there, then you means you are getting a colour reaction. Um, now, if you've got time, um, what might be worth having a look at is uh, Becky Yar's uh, five-minute video that she did on how she does chemical testing, which I think is quite a useful one. Um, before I do that, I just mentioned that actually on the BLS website, there's some very good resources um, on chemical testing, um, which I could, I'll could i post the, um, the address uh, on, on an email, which I'll send out to you later on. Um, for uh, uh, an item which they've got on chemical testing. Another thing that's worth having a look at is downloadable. If you really want to get into this, um, there's this book here, which is um, for free on the website, which is called Microchemical Methods for the Identification of Lichens. And to be honest, uh, most of it is completely over my head. Um, and a lot of the techniques I'll probably never use, but it's very good on the basic uh, testing and what you expect to get and the kind of um, chemicals uh, um, that you're testing for. So without further ado, I shall show the video now. And that's basically it. And then if you've got any questions, um, let me know. It's it's a big area, but I think it's in it's to move on to the next stage of identifying things beyond what they look like and the, uh, the basic features. Um, this is where um, you need to go in a sense uh, to especially to recognize some of the more difficult things and um, which there are a lot of in lichens, I think, as I've found. So I'll just put that on, I'll share my screen. Yeah. Now, can we see this all right? Yeah. Is there meant to be any sound? I can't hear it. Oh, can you not hear the sound? No, me neither. Mm. I was just going to ask the same thing. Uh, yeah, there is sp supposed to be sound. Uh, you got headphones in or anything, Fred? That I have a little microscope slide here. You can use anything, and that that tree now, in the middle of it that looks wet is my dot of KOH. Thank you, thank you. I'll start so it I again. Have a bottle. Here's my dropper coming in. I'm going to show you how to do spot tests using 10% KOH on this specimen of Parmelia silicata. Normally, when you do a spot test, you get asked about the spot in the medulla or the cortex. There's a good reason for that. There are different chemicals in each of the chemical in each of the parts of the thallus. So if we zoom in to the specimen, we can see a 
a lobe here with ceridia in seralia. There. And then we can see the cortex here, which is a little bit shiny, isn't it? The reason that you get test you get asked to do a spot test on the medulla versus the cortex is because they often have different colors. So the way I want to show you how to do this is to show you my setup with the chemicals. So if I go back out for a minute, I'm going to tell you that I have a little microscope slide here. You can use anything. And that, that tiny dot in the middle of it that looks wet is my dot of KOH. So I have a dropper bottle. Here's my dropper coming in. Look at the size of that drop. <clears throat> it's huge. It would flood an entire specimen of a lichen. So instead I use the corner of a razor blade to dip into that and then take a tiny bit out. And I'll show you what that looks like. So if I take the corner of my razor blade and then I just touch the slide, you can see the size of the dot that we're after. It's really small, okay? So the technique that I use even in the field is just to use the corner of my blade and then touch it to the lichen in question. So we'll bring the lichen back under our view. And we want to be able to make sure we know which part of the lichen we're going to focus in on. <clears throat> the cortex of Parmelia has atronorin. And it's a beautiful K plus lemon yellow. The medulla, which is exposed where the ceridia are present, has a different chemical reaction. It starts out lemon yellow, but watch it because it's going, it's going to change. So when you want to do a medu medulla test, you can use the ceridia if you have some, or you can scrape away the cortex. I'll show you how to do that in a second. So you can see really clearly that the cortex is a yellow, K plus yellow, and the medulla is K plus red. Okay, so we have different chemicals in the cortex versus the medulla. Now, if you have a piece of lichen that doesn't have a nice patch of ceridia uh, available, then what do you do? Well, let's imagine we want to test a lobe like this one. There are patches of ceridia there, but they're so tiny. Uh, they're, just, they're just breaks in the cortex, and the medulla is visible, but the cortex may get in the way of that. So we want to just scrape away the outer cortex to expose the medulla. And when you have that nice white view of cottony hyphae, because that's after all what's inside here, hyphae, the filamentous uh, microscopic threads, that's where you can do the test on the medulla. Okay, so you scrape that away. In the field, I'll just, I'll get that back in a second, but in the field, I don't have a microscope slide with me. So here's what I do in the field. I do have a dropper of some kind, and I will carry a razor blade in the field with me as well. So I just touch the corner of my razor blade to the edge of my dropper until I see a little bit of wet, and there's a drop on the edge. Now that edge, that drop is actually huge. So if you see the size of that drop against the bit of lichen where I scraped away the medulla, uh, the cortex, I'm sorry. You can see it's too big, isn't it? It's too big. So then what do I do? Well, I have a tiny piece of tissue. Let's get rid of some extra. Let's get rid of some of that. You don't need all that, right? Get rid of it. And still, there's still plenty on there. That means when you come in to do the test, you can just do a tiny spot. And it's much more controlled. You definitely wouldn't want to use the tip of a dropper bottle. I'm going to show you the tip of a dropper bottle. The size of it. You couldn't possibly control that. Or even a needle tip. Here's a needle tip coming in. Where's my needle tip? There it is. Look at the size of the needle tip. I mean, that's massive. Oh, it's coming out. So we don't want to do that. Good technique. Right. That's it, really. I hope that's useful. Thanks, Fred. Thank you. <laughs> I hadn't seen that video before, and it's really, it's really clear, doesn't it? And it does bring home that I've been doing it with two bigger drops, <laughs> so I'm going to change my technique. 
That was entirely my feeling. That's why I wanted to share it all, to share with anybody who was thinking of doing chemical testing, is you don't have to plaster the world with K and C. <laughs> but you do need to be careful with the razor blades. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. A little tin is helpful. <laughs> Put things like that in. And even your eyedropper bottles, actually. Is that video on YouTube, do you know, Fred? Because it needs to be. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, do you know, I think it was. I looked for it this afternoon. I could not find it. But I know I downloaded it for the labs group um, ages ago. Becky and see if she can. Yeah, she definitely, can. definitely. Yeah, it's, it's so good. Yes. Brilliant, yeah. Really good. Would you in the field? Would you keep sort of one razor blade for K and one for C and keep them separate so you don't? Because you know, no, it doesn't no, matter. I just, I just well. wipe them with tissue. Yeah, I mean, you don't really need a razor blade necessarily. I mean, you can even use a twig or something. Um, they can work just as well. The nice thing about the razor, but the single sided razor blade you've got is there's other uses for it as well. Like, for example, if you wanted to take a sample of a crustose lichen on a rock in some apothecia, you can, uh, this is a, uh, a sort of a, quite a delicate technique with the razor blade. You just run it along the rock with a bit of tissue against it and just collect some of the apothecia to maybe test at home or to look under the microscope. Okay. Well, I was going to talk to you about recording I mean, I can do it in two minutes, but I am conscious that it's very nearly nine o'clock. Shall we save it for another time or are you happy to do two minutes now and it would only be that? Go for it. Go for it. Okay, now I have the joy of sharing my screen, which is always a... I can never see what I'm looking for on here either. There we go. Okay, can you see my screen now? Yep. So this is the Saving Devon's Treescapes recording platform. And as you can see from the tabs at the top, we're recording more than just lichens on here. So if you're involved in tree recording or brown hair streak butterfly surveys, you also record your results on here. But if you're using this for the first time, the first thing you'd need to do is go to the user info tab. And that just asks you to put in your name and your email address. And there's a little tick box to consent there. The I've only ha ever had to do this once. Once I've pressed submit, every time I come back to this, it's there again. And I don't need to put it in twice. So it will always then know that it's me that's doing the recording on this particular app. So I've just clicked on the like an app tab at the top. And if I scroll down, you'll see the first thing on here is a map. Um, this is a fairly new feature, and when it first comes on, it's assuming that if you're using this on a mobile phone that you've got a good enough phone signal, that's the first point, so always check that. But sitting here at home as I am with a reasonable Wi-Fi connection, I am somewhere within this blob, so it's telling me I'm in Exeter. You can zoom in, and if I am at home but recording something that I surveyed yesterday, for example, then I don't want it to record my home address as the location. So the grid reference below that map at the moment is giving you the center of that circle. So I'm going to say I was at our DWT reserve at Wooda, and I was over here in the woodland. So you can zoom in to where you actually were. And then you can go to an aerial view and you can actually see what tree you were looking at. So I'm going to say I was surveying that tree. So there's my circle now. And the grid reference has changed to the grid reference for the centre of that tree. That has also appeared in the location underneath. So always check if your map is showing the right location that it's also copied down here. If you don't have the right signal, you can override that and type in your own location in this box not the box below the map, but the box here. And that's the location that it, the record will be made on. I'm going to say I did my survey yesterday. So just pick the calendar date. And species, little bit of history here. When the project first started, we picked 12 key species that we were keen for people to identify and record. And those are the 12 that you'll find on this drop down menu. 
with a catch-all other at the bottom. I'm having this changed because I've moved away from talking about the 12 species now because I think it's more important that people are recording what you're confident in recording, um, regardless of whether it's one of these 12 species as, or not, because lichens are generally under-recorded and we welcome records of any species on any substrate. So whilst that's being amended, the way I'm using this at the moment is to click other, and then there's some options as to, to describe the habitat you were working in. So I'm gonna say it was a woodland, I was working on a tree, and it was an oak. Now, if I would just looked at lichens on the branch or the trunk, I would pick one of those. Because I'm gonna do a whole species list for what I found on this one tree, regardless of whether it was the branch or the trunk, I'm just gonna tick other. And I'm not gonna record any sizes because this is gonna be more than one species on here as well. So I'm just gonna say one tree surveyed, branches and trunk, oops, I can type. And then I'm gonna list my species and I'm just gonna put abbreviations for now. Obviously I would write this out in full. So we'll have some Xanthoria, some Ramelina, some Isnia and so on. At the bottom, if you've done this on one of the surveys that you were out with us, for example, with Nathan or with April or with Fred present, and they've verified your identifications, I would put at the bottom here, verified by Fred. Because that's just an extra little note. It's not just me surveying on my own and, you know, are we really sure that Lindsay knows what she's talking about or not? I'm far happier that that's an accurate record if Fred's verified it. And that's all you need to do. And then at the bottom, I would click to upload. I'm not going to do this because obviously this isn't an accurate and true record. But once you do click on that, you'll see a little a message down the bottom of the screen that says your submission was successful. And again, if you're using a, this on a mobile phone, you might need to scroll down to see that. So you might go, oh, well, the, all the information is still there. I'm not sure if it's uploaded or not. Just scroll down and you should see that message. And then you can move on to the next survey. Hopefully that will change from this drop down list to a way to record multiple species with a space to put their thallus diameter and any other necessary details on there. Um, because otherwise, as this is set up at the moment, if you were going to list each species, you'd just be doing this. You know, you'd be hundreds of records for the same branch that you'd surveyed when all the other details are the same in terms of its location and the date, etc. So my tip at the moment is to use that other and then just in the notes section, write all the species and any other notes you want to about the location and the survey. Hopefully that looks quite straightforward. Do you want us to do that with yes, please. Anthoria pariotina and everything else? Yes, please. Yes. Anything that you're confident in doing, Martin, we very much appreciate the records coming in and they will be part of the Devon uh, biodiversity species database that's held by Devon Biodiversity Record Centre and they will be shared with the British Lichen Society as well so we're adding to the national picture as well as the picture of lichens in Devon. Does it allow for you to backdate because I actually haven't yeah. submitted very many so the last six months I can probably <laughs> put quite a few on. That would be amazing I mean go through some of your presentations for labs and get those on there but yes yeah. absolutely you can you can change that calendar Right. I haven't tested it how far back, but oh, quite a long way. <laughs> oh, yes. I suggest you don't future date them, but please, no. do, please do back date. <laughs> of course, yeah. <laughs> and is that only for trees, lichens on trees? No. So, of course, we are a tree-based yeah. project. So our focus and, and our events, as you would have noticed, are, are mainly focused on trees. But some of those species will grow on other substrates as well, or you might just have an interest in looking at things other than trees as well. So for, to record things that are on different substrates, again, just tick that other box. And then in the notes, make sure you say you were looking at a gravestone or you're looking at the curbstone or the church wall or whatever it was. And the type of rock, if you can say, is, is always helpful too. So, Lindsay, April's been telling us 
don't worry, just go to the genus level. Yeah, yeah. This list is going to species level. So, if you can, if you can, Toby. Um, you just, is there going to be an option to be able to just say the genus, if, if that's what you're yeah. thinking? Yeah, well, what I'm saying is you don't have to pick one of these. In fact, yeah. I'd say please don't. So just write to the level that you're comfortable. So you could just put Pariotina, you could just put Usnia yeah. in there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions on that? Yes, hello. Um, yeah. Can I just ask, um, I put in one yesterday for a dog lichen. Well done, it thank you. It allows you to put in one photograph, and just considering um, some of the issues we've had looking at photographs today, yeah. if someone yeah. needs to verify my rather vague ideas, is it possible to be able to add in some more? Because I'd yeah. try to take some photos of the underneath to show other features that that might be helpful. Bless you. Yes, um, I'm gonna. I am gonna ask for that to be uh, more than one photo. In the meantime, if you want to send photos in, you can email them to me, and I can then get them linked retrospectively with the record. Um, I think I will also ask for this to have just have some little notes about the photos. You know, please make sure you show the upper surface, the lower surface. Um, any fruiting bodies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, just so that there's a little bit of guidance on there just to remind people what's what's helpful to have in photos. But you're quite right. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? We on the DWT website. Sorry, Martin, you broke up at the beginning but, there. I think you are so asking. It, yeah, is it just on the, is it obvious on the DWT website? No, this is a completely separate website. So the web addresses are there at the top. So it's www.devontreescapes.com. Hopefully you can see that. And it is mobile friendly. But the caveat is, depends where you are in our wonderful county as to what sort of signal you've got. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to say a huge thank you to April um, and to Fred and to all of you for your contributions tonight. I think it's been a really helpful session. Um, there's been a lot of sharing there, a lot of learning, and um, it's exactly what we're aiming for with this group. So I hope, I hope you feel that we're continuing to support your learning. I definitely feel that you're supporting mine, um, and I'm very grateful for that. So I look forward to seeing you on future occasions. And please do, you know, send me an email after the event and let me know what you'd like to, to hear more about in the future and how we can you know, develop future sessions for you. Um, April or Fred, anything you'd like to say in conclusion? Just keep up the amazing work, really. Yeah, yeah thank you for having me. Um, anything I can ever do to help, just shout pretty much. Um, Lindsay's got my details, so... Yeah, very keen to support as much as possible. <laughs> much appreciated. Okay, on that note, I will stop the recording and say good evening, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your nights. Thanks a lot, Thanks Lindsay. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Fred. Thanks, Lindsay.